Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Brian Crombie Radio Hour on Saga 960. I want to in, in, introduce you tonight to a very impressive uh, young lady, Maria Avdiva, who is the research director at the European Expert Association. She's uh, uh, got a law degree and a PhD, uh, and she comes to us from Kharkiv, Ukraine. And she wants to talk to us tonight, number one, about her own reality in, in Kharkiv, and then uh, we're going to talk a little bit about disinformation uh, that's going on uh, in, in Russia uh, and what it's like uh, in this uh, obviously uh, unbelievable situation with the Russian invasion of uh, Ukraine. So, uh, Maria, welcome to the show. Uh, how are you? Tell us how, how it is in Kharkiv right now. Hello, thank you for having me. It's a great pleasure and possibility. Uh, today is as it was during the last uh, 25 days of this war. Uh, so the Russian shelling continues day and night, and uh, but not, Russia has changed its tactics. Uh, so uh, Kharkiv is the second largest city of Ukraine. It had a population of one and a half million people before the war started. And Russia's plan, primarily plan, was to get control over Kharkiv in the first days. But uh, it didn't work out that way, as with uh, neither uh, big, uh, large uh, Ukrainian city. And that's why when they understood they cannot move further, they started to use the sky to terrorize civilians, bombard the cities and uh, uh, shell the residential areas. And they do that for, for, for almost three weeks now. And now the city is sort of very deserted. I have never seen Kharkiv like that before. The city center is heavily destroyed. Uh, it is said by, by in, light, in latest Belenkat report that the Kharkiv had major uh, destruction of all uh, Ukrainian cities. You know, official numbers uh, give us that uh, 600,000 people left Kharkiv using the railway transportation only. Then around the same number left the city using the cars, uh, their own, own cars. And I, well, I think that probably 300,000 people still are in the city. Uh, most of them are hiding somewhere. Uh, people hide in the shelters, in the basement or in the metro, in the subway. Uh, I, I have been to the subway station myself and saw, for example, a young uh, woman which gave birth to a baby boy uh, on the 24th, um, and the 24th of February, actually, when the war started. And for all this time, she is living there in the uh, car, in the train car, on, in the underground uh, with her baby boy. And so every day I see those uh, terrifying stories of people who, who, who lose uh, everything because of the war, who now have no houses, no homes where to come back and no possibility for normal life and who were forced to flee or stay in the city, but under constant shellings and bombardments. Where, where are you and, uh, and how have you kept safe and, and why have you not left? Well, I, I am in my apartment in, in the corridor, in the hallway. So I moved my, my table because it was previously near the window now when the curfew is, uh, uh, is, uh, is in place. And generally, we are not like, uh, uh, we are advised not to stay near the windows. So I stay, so that is two walls between me and the street. So if the airstrike happens i will have at least two walls and then i can lie down on the floor and and hopefully nothing will fall on my head uh, but then of course it's no safe place uh, in the city at all but uh, i am lucky to live in the area which was not heavily bombarded so there are some i would say four residential areas which are under constant strikes they are situated closer to the russia so to the north and northeast of the city and that is why when Russia shells that areas, they are under constant shell and, and very much destruction are there. And that means that people have no heating, no electricity, no water supply. And the last week, the temperature outside was minus 15 degrees Celsius. It means that if you are, have no heating, you cannot survive in your apartment and you have you know, to, to find some place where to go. So I am lucky to have all of these and especially what is more important network because I need to get connection with the world. So I stay here and I decided to stay because I think this is very important to show the world, the international community, what is happening on the ground because Russia uh, denies 
all the war crimes committed now in Ukraine. They call it special military operation. They say that they need to denazify Ukraine and Kharkiv. And Kharkiv always was a Russian-speaking city. There are no Nazis here and in, in other parts of Ukraine as well. But still, and uh, Kharkiv, Kharkiv, people here had before the war normal relations or connections with Russians who were living like only 40 kilometers from, from Kharkiv. So uh, that's why I think it is very important to show the truth because Russia is investing a lot of resources to create this alternative reality to, uh, to deny and to uh, push forward the narrative about Ukraine preparing some kind of dirty nuclear bomb or they also say that about the biological weapons laboratories funded by U.S. on Ukrainian territory and other outrageous lies. And especially, I am concentrating on uh, bombardments and using missiles on residential areas because using this uh, cluster munition in the city is a war crime. And I want to show that what is happening so that Russian lies will not have place and the people will actually see what is the real situation. And, and, and how are you showing this and, and why? I go out every day uh, during the daytime with my phone and, uh, I, I, and take pictures and usual videos uh, about the, the latest destructions. So as it happens during the night and over days, uh, I mean, the bombardments and shellings, I have lots of of places which I can show and uh, explain what has happened there. So I will make the short videos, put them on Twitter and uh, share that with, with, uh, with people and uh, they will watch it. And uh, also uh, there are very few international media here, if at all any. And uh, that's why someone who is showing the information on the ground, I think is very important because uh, Russia uses information right now in this war as another type of warfare. They use uh, tanks, missiles, rockets, and information because it, it is a kind of hybrid war where they use everything. And that's why our, um, well, I see myself also on this information battlefield as the one who is fighting with Russia with what I have. And what I have is truth and true information which I can provide and thus help Ukrainian and Ukrainian forces to fight this Russian aggression. Maria Avdiva, uh, thank you so much for joining us. I really appreciate it. This is fascinating. We're going to take a break for some messages and come back more with Maria, who is calling into us from Kharkiv, Ukraine right now. Uh, stay with us, everybody. Welcome back, everyone, to the Brian Crombie Radio, where we're having a special uh, uh, show today interviewing Maria Avdiva, who is the research director at the European Expert Association, uh, or at least she was, until uh, a couple of weeks ago when uh, Russia invaded her country. Uh, she is calling uh, into us today from uh, Kharkiv, uh, Ukraine, um, and uh, has been telling us a little bit about what it's like in Kharkiv and also a little bit about disinformation. Uh, you know, let me take a minute and tell you a little bit about our guest. Uh, as I mentioned, the research director at the European Expert Association, focusing on international security, and cooperation of Ukraine with the EU and NATO in combating hybrid threats and emergency security, emerging security challenges. Uh, she analyzes information operations, effort, efforts to counter disinformation and threats to democracy. She has developed her expertise through working at the National Institute for Strategic Studies and several international research projects. She is the author and instructor of a course on information security conducted as part of a national security course. She's been the moderator and speaker of multiple international conferences on information and cybersecurity at the George Marshall Center Partnership for Peace Consortium at Visegrad Foundation Project Pravo Justice. She's authored a number of publications and articles on the detection and counteraction of information operations in Ukraine, Belarus, and Poland. Maria obtained her master's degrees in international law and legal studies from the Yaroslav Mudria National Law University and did PhD programs in political sciences. Uh, alumni of legislative fellows programs in Washington and the deputy head of the Yaroslav Mudria National Law University Alumni Association. In addition to being a native speaker of Ukrainian, she is fluent in English and Russian and speaks German. We are honored to have you uh, with such a background, such an education, 
such experience and the personal uh, experience that you're currently uh, um, being subjected to uh, join us. Uh, thank you uh, again, Maria, for joining us. So, so let's uh, talk a little bit about, uh, about Kharkiv, if we could. Um, tell our listeners in Toronto, if you could, in Canada, um, where Kharkiv is. Um, and, uh, and I understand, as you said, that most of Kharkiv was Russian speaking. Uh, and, and so a lot of people have told me they're surprised that Russia is being so uh, vehement in its uh, in destruction of, of a city that they almost were suggesting by their information or disinformation that wanted to be liberated because it was subject to uh, subjugation by uh, Nazis in the Ukraine. And, and by doing this, they're almost completely destroying their disinformation campaign. Tell us a little bit about uh, the situation, if you could. Thank you for, for this warm welcome. I'm really honored to speak with, with you and with your audience. Uh, yes, Kharkiv uh, is situated on the uh, far east uh, of Ukraine, very close to Russia. It's only 40 kilometers from where I live, live to, the, to the Russian border. And uh, it always had... Uh, uh, close connections with Russia, especially before Russia started this war in 2014. And moreover, uh, during uh, the Soviet revolution, Bolsheviks revolutions in 1917, it used to be the first capital of the Soviet Ukraine. So the, the capital of the Soviet Ukraine for some time, for several years, was, situ was, was located in Kharkiv. So Kharkiv had a very important and has a very important strategic meaning uh, for Russia and for Putin, because that is why he wants to get control over this uh, second largest uh, Ukrainian city. And uh, during because of this historical background, uh, Kharkiv is a Russian speaking city and Ukrainian language was never discriminated here as Putin wants that to show. And uh, but still, uh, Russia was so deep into this propaganda and disinformation that it seems like they themselves believed in the lies they were spreading, that people here needs to be liberated from some kind of Nazis, or someone is discriminated here because of the language, or that probably they were counting that uh, Russian troops that will come here will not, will not meet such a fire resistance. From, from Ukrainians, because what we see now, uh, the, uh, the Russian troops which came here, uh, they are mostly young conscripts or like troops that are not ready to fight. And when they put down their weapons and Ukrainian military capture them, and we see on videos them talking about the, what, why, why are they here? They usually say that they were told that they will not see here any fire resistance and they were told that they will have to denazify and, and uh, protect people here from someone. So uh, Putin and his regime, they, uh, they, now, they completely uh, know, uh, uh, d developed this propaganda and disinformation for Russia, for Russian people, so they do not understand this real picture. Uh, of what is happening. I hope that in some time and very soon they will see what is the real situation in Ukraine and understand it. So they were miscalculating, uh, uh, obviously, about uh, what they will face in Ukraine. Um, you know, what is astounding to me is that they, they would be shelling residential areas so thoroughly when they want these people in Kharkiv to become part of their country again. Like it, it just doesn't make logical sense. Can you explain that at all? Yeah, that doesn't make logical sense for everyone here. And what I what I hear uh, speaking uh, to people outside is why are they doing this to us? That's what uh, locals, like ordinary people who are hiding in shelters, say to me. They do not understand the point. Why is it happening? And what is the reason? Of destroying uh, the, the this this city, my only like, my only explanation must might be is that Putin is so much frustrated and disorientated because of that uh, everything went not according to his plan, because he was saying that he will get control over Kiev in a couple of days and the, the and other Ukrainian cities as well, 
and now it's uh, 25 days and still they're not able to get control over any major city and Kharkiv as well, which he was thinking probably will be uh, ready for, you know, for this liberation Russian troops to come in and, uh, and they will be meet here. But no, it didn't happen so. And now he is furious about that and he gives this order to bombard and and to destroy the city, to destroy the historical center, which actually uh, was here before the World War II and survived Nazi occupation. And now all these buildings are dis- destroyed by Russians who claim that they were liberators and that, that they were uh, during the World War II that they liberated the the, the world of, of Nazi. But now he is turning himself into the Nazi regime. And that is what we are seeing actually, that that is the start of Russian collapse because I don't see any possibility of for further development of Russia as it is now because the truth will, will so the world will see the truth and Russians will see the truth. And there will be this moment when you know everything will come out as it happened after the World War II and the people responsible for war crimes will be sitting in the Hague before the court and will be punished for what they have done. But, you know, so, so you're many dis- more... You're, you are a disinformation expert. Um, and we're not... No one's talking about attacking Russia yet uh, at all. Um, how will how will Russia find out the truth? If, if you know, in World War II, obviously what happened is Nazi Germany was, uh, was attacked and occupied. Um, and and Hitler killed himself, and and all the the general staff were put on trial, and lots of others. That's a different scenario than today. Today, you know, I think at best what we think is that 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 either your president will negotiate some sort of uh, a, a peace, or somehow uh, Ukraine, with the help of, uh, of of armaments from the West, will uh, will discourage Russia, and they'll return to Russia. Um, but none of that would mean the end of Putin or his regime. How will Russia? How will Russia? Uh, how will Russians find out the truth? Well, it's now in 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 this era when everyone has a smartphone and you can get access to the information when you want to. It's very difficult to hide everything. So they are of course trying to do so. I mean, Russians. There is a military censorship in place, and they banned the Facebook and Twitter and are about to ban YouTube so that people will not get access to the information. But there are many Russians who do not want to live in the sanctioned Russia, who do not want to suffer because of Putin, who want to have access they had to, you know, to all the Western democracy can give them possibility to travel, to have some goods, uh, to have something, the new iPhones. And they do not want now to live uh, as they used to live during the Soviet times when everything was great, nothing uh, in the shops, and they do not re- want to return. So they now, some of them are fleeing, others are just staying in Russia and saying that they disagree. Uh, generally, to, uh, the latest numbers show us that approximately 20% of Russian population supports now the war against Ukraine. So this is the the large part of people. Probably they are silent till some moment, but this moment will come when they will come out on the streets and tell Putin that they do not want to suffer because of him and his politics. And also his inner circle, those oligarchs and you know, high profile officials around Putin who are now suffering because they cannot go and visit you know, their villas in France or England and their children will have to come back to Russia from uh, American universities and they will not be able to, uh, to, know, to use their yachts somewhere in Morocco or in, in Monaco. So uh, they will all, you know, think and probably will tell Putin those that's that's now the point where we have to stop because we do not suffer anymore because of uh, of your politics. And I think this this moment will come and it will come sooner possible than we are thinking. I understand that you're, as you said, 40 kilometers from the Russian border. I'm not sure if you uh, know much about Canadian U.S. politics and geography, but uh, but one in four Canadians 
has a blood relative in the United States. So that there's a lot of families that uh, that have cousins or or or, or offspring or or whatnot uh, across the border, and and so information flows readily back and forth between families. I think I've heard that a lot of Ukrainians have cousins and blood relatives in Russia and and the vice versa. Is information going back and forth between families and 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 how is that impacting uh, both families and the war? Yeah, you are exactly right, especially for the Eastern Ukraine, because this is the case. And uh, I will quickly tell you the story we had with the video of this captured uh, pilot, uh, a mayor uh, from the Russian Air Forces. And he told, uh, he was given a press conference and he told that uh, when he was given the order to bombard the residential areas, he knew that his relatives are living here in Kharkiv. So he knew that he was probably uh, dropping bombs on the on the houses where his his relatives live, but still he he did this. So he he fulfilled this criminal order. And about the the information, uh, uh, mostly what I hear is that Russians are so uh, so hard. Uh, uh, affected by this propaganda and disinformation that they do not want to hear or see any truth coming out of Ukraine. They continue deny it. They continue saying that uh, everyone, there is no truth at all and all uh, sides are lying and uh, the, the, tr the truth is somewhere in the middle. They continue to, to, to speak about this uh, I know about this Nazis in Ukraine and the, the reason so for that is that there is this small majority which is a very aggressive I told you about about 20 percent which are aggressively supporting Putin and then there is this uh, so, sorry minority and there is this majority of 80 percent which is silent and they are they will keep silent until the moment will come when they will not be able to to keep silent anymore. And then this moment will uh, initiate some changes in the political situation in Russia. Because for now, they just prefer to close their eyes and ears and to pretend that nothing is happening and they do not have to do anything with that. I traveled to uh, Kiev and did business in, uh, in 2006 to 2010. And, and I I would have meetings in Ukrainian and meetings in, in Russian and, uh, and would interact with accountants and, and uh, business people and banks that were associated with, uh, with the West and other ones that were you know, associated with Moscow. Um, and everyone seemed to you know, work together. They, they competed uh, as businesses always do and banks always do, uh, but, but it, it was accepted, I thought, that uh, people spoke two different languages and people talked about that they would uh, would study both languages in high school or university. Um, were Russian speaking people prejudiced in any way in Ukraine? No, of course not. That is not the case. Uh, it never was the case. I myself grew up in a Russian speaking uh, family. My school was in Ukrainian university education in Ukrainian. Never ever I have no. I've seen any discrimination and the, any people in, in Ukraine as well. So this is the, the language issue is the issue which uh, Russia tries to manipulate to create this radicalization in Ukraine, but it is not working anymore. People who are now fighting on the forefront, they very now, it's very common they will they speak that they will speak Russian and they you know uh, they are fighting for Ukraine no less than those who are speaking Ukrainian. So this is artificially brought by Russia here because that is what Russia is doing in all other countries. They will find some weak points uh, and some you know uh, thin thin lines and try to uh, to to push them, try to radicalize societies based on, on that uh, differences. And sometimes it will work, but it is not working anymore in Ukraine because Ukraine is now united as never before. I have never seen Ukraine like, like this like at, in, in, any, in any period of the modern Ukrainian history, united to fight this, uh, this aggression and the, the only, the, the only thing which uh, which unites ukraine now well not only but the most see the unites ukraine the most is the the feeling of revenge and the feeling that we must win 
in this war and we must resist and we can do it only if we will be together. I, I just, I'm, I fail to understand how Putin thinks that given what you just said, how he can ever get you and your fellow country people to be countrymen with him and part of a new expanded Russian empire. Like, how is that possible? I don't think that is it is possible, and that is what why I think he was miscalculated. There were reports that probably his um, his higher uh, special service, uh, the heads of special services of Russian intelligence and FSB, they were telling uh, Putin that they were uh, like preparing the ground that the 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 Russian invasion will probably meet not as fire as resistance, and they will find groups that will support. And they will be able to do what they have done in Donbass, you know, uh, spreading disinformation, then uh, uh, then sending there some saboteurs groups, and then creating the so-called republics. So they were probably uh, working on that uh, here in Ukraine, but it didn't uh, it didn't work according to the Putin's plan. And now he is in the dead end. I don't know what he will do next, and that is very threatening because. Well, he now understands that it is no way of how he can return uh, Ukraine to any kind of Russian influence because uh, Ukrainians are now more anti-Russian than ever before. And uh, there is nothing he can do with, the, with that. And so now he can go on with uh, using any kind of other weapons or like very heavy weapons because he is so furious and he will try to just completely destroy Ukraine because you know what we have seen during the Stalin's time and Russia is now very much alike what was happening there. When Stalin saw that some nation is not obedient like Crimean Tatars, he would took all the nation and send them to Siberia to die or to work uh, on, on the, uh, you know, in the impossible conditions. And they were replacing just, just generally the population from one part of the country to the other or sending them to the camps. So we have all seen this already and now it is again what is happening in Russia now. So I, that is what is threatening and that is why I think it's very important to, to tell the world now that we are not provoking, you are not provoking Putin by helping Ukraine. He is already in this full war and he must be stopped before it's too late, before we know we see new concentration camps or something more threatening uh, in Russia or anywhere. We're chatting tonight with Maria Avdiva, who is a research director at the European Expert Association. She's in Kharkiv, um, uh, Ukraine. She's uh, got a law degree, a PhD. Um, you know, it's amazing. Uh, and thank you for the work that you're doing. Uh, telephone, uh, uh, televising uh, to the world with your telephone um, what's happening in, uh, in your home city. We're going to take a break for some messages and come back more with Maria in just a minute. Stay with us, everybody. Welcome back, everyone, to the Brian Crombie Radio Hour on Saga 960. Um, I'm having uh, a fascinating time tonight, uh, uh, but a scary time at the same time and a very concerning time. Uh, talking uh, with uh, our guest, who uh, is uh, um, speaking to us from Kharkiv, Ukraine, her home city. Her name is uh, Maria Avdiva. Um, she's got a fascinating background. And I think, you know, one of the interesting things, and this is going to sound um, a little bit strange, I guess, but, you know, I think when we think about wars in, in the Middle East and Afghanistan and Iran, Iraq and Syria and places like that, they seem very remote and very different. Um, maybe because the people... Um, you know, we don't associate with the people as closely. Uh, but when you speak with someone like Maria, uh, and, and just to give you a sense, you know, she's got a master's degree in international law and legal studies. She uh, uh, was a director of the Digital Forensic Research Lab. Uh, she uh, went to uh, a national law university where she was deputy head of the Alumni Association and an instructor in the information security course. She was an expert in International Strategic Action Network for Security and the cybersecurity expert for an organization called OSCE. And she was a founder of the European Expert Association. She's been involved in Ukraine. She's been involved in Belarus. She speaks Ukrainian, uh, Russian, uh, English, and, uh, and German. Um, 
you know, it, Maria is someone who could be my sister-in-law, uh, and uh, and it's uh, it's 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 it hits close to home, and maybe all wars should hit close home, should hit this close to home, and and we should uh, um, personalize it uh, to the same degree. Uh, maybe that's my feeling that uh, I haven't to the same extent, but what's going on in Ukraine um, does hit close to home. Um, I do have. Uh, uh, in-laws, uh, former in-laws, and uh, and cousins that are in uh, Ukraine and uh, in Poland, uh, in uh, in Slovakia. Um, I've worked in Ukraine. I've worked in in uh, in Poland. I've been to uh, to Moldova. I've been to Saint Petersburg and Moscow and Russia. Um, and so, this war, this invasion, I think for a lot of us hits home. Maria, what do you think the West should do? What should we in Canada do? What do you want us to do? Well, and thank you so much for this gen generous presentation. I really appreciate, and uh, it's a great honor for me to speak to to your audience, Canadians, because you know many Ukrainians have uh, fled uh, to Canada before during the Stalin's time, the totalitarian time of the Soviet era, and now again some of my friends are now in Canada because Canada also opened the doors for people who who were forced to flee Ukraine. Uh, speaking about what West can do, Western countries do a lot now for Ukrainian migrants. Uh, actually, they want all of them usually want to come back, but there are some situations when people don't have a place where they can stay safely, especially if they have children. There are uh, estimated that 3.3 million of people have flee Ukraine. Most of them went to Poland, but also to other to other Western uh, countries and uh, to, to Canada as well. Uh, what Ukraine is asking for, what President Zelensky is pushing for, is the, for the uh, no-fly zone uh, above Ukraine. That means that uh, if Russia uses the Ukrainian sky to terrorize the, the people in Ukraine, to kill civilians, to commit these war crimes by hitting uh, with missile uh, system residential areas, that means that if there will be a no-fly zone and they will not be used, uh, will not be able to use aviation, uh, then uh, there will be a possibility for Ukraine to end this war uh, in shorter terms without so much losses among civilians. Uh, we, call, we can call it... Uh, differently. We can give that other names because uh, uh, it's not necessarily to call it this, na this name, but the, the reason is that uh, Ukraine needs now to get any kind of uh, defensive weapons that will allow uh, Ukraine to, to fight, uh, to combat the, uh, uh, the air, the fighter jets that, uh, that Russia uses and uh, to, uh, to use these uh, air defense systems more effectively and to have them more uh, and uh, to have other other types of defensive weapons. And uh, Russia understands that, and that is why they are targeting uh, the Western part of Ukraine. Lviv, for example, they are showing that uh, if uh, if these supplies will come will, will start coming to Ukraine, Russia will be targeting the, the the roads and the logistics. So that means that we should act quickly because uh, Russia is only is also uh, you know uh, they they have major losses which they never thought they will have, and they need to now to regroup their troops and to to get more resources, and we need to use this time wisely. I mean the West and the and and act very quickly. I hope that a lot is being done. We had the latest reports from the Ukrainian Ministry of Defense saying that please do not give a exact naming of what. Uh, help comes from the Western countries to Ukraine so that Russians will not understand the, the picture and the, they will not understand what is actually happening. So not to be too open to them so that they will not target this help. But we have very good signs and understanding that this help is coming. And I urge uh, everyone to to push the governments uh, to, to provide more help to Ukraine because the, if Ukraine will be able to defend itself, it will mean that we will be able to defend whole Europe. If it fails and Putin gets out, so with what he is doing in Ukraine, he will go next for other countries. He will not stop here because, that? sorry? 
You believe that? You believe that Ukraine is is not the end game, it's just a first step? Of course. Yeah, absolutely. Now he is in full control over territory of Belarus. I mean, military control. All kinds of Russian weapons are already there. They are targeting Ukraine from the territory of Belarus. It means that Russian troops are now on the border with Poland, with Baltic republics. Russian state media openly discuss what countries they will invade next. So they speak about that on the Russian state TV channels in prime time. Really? They, we, yes, we of course. That, it, at least I haven't heard that in, uh, in Canada. So you're saying Russian it, state TV is already talking about if Ukraine is successful, what country they're going to invade next? Yeah, they say exactly so literally that uh, let Ukrainians do not think uh, that we will stop in Lviv, which is the western part of Ukraine. We will go further to Poland. So that was on, on Russian uh, state TV channels on prime time uh, show, which of course is Russian propaganda, because that is what we see from Russian state TV channels. But it shows us the state of mind of, of where they are looking at. Uh, Russian uh, Ministry of Defense for already several weeks in a row now is discussing that uh, the possibility of using chemical weapons, but they show it like they create this base for possible uh, uh, false flag operations. What they say is they say that Ukraine is mining chemical weapons, uh, sorry, chemical uh, facilities in Ukraine to blow them up and then to accuse Russia of that. And that means that Russia will m might actually any moment do it and then, uh, you know, create this chemical weapons uh, uh, disaster in Ukraine. They have control over two major nuclear power plants in Ukraine, that is Zaporizhia and Chernobyl nuclear power plants. And Zaporizhia is the uh, biggest nuclear power plant in Europe, and now there are Russian troops there, and the situation there is not under Ukrainian control anymore. So this is all very threatening, and that means that Putin will not stop here if we do not stop him and do not make him you know, for move back to Russia or somehow create the situation when he will not move further. Tell me about Belarus. You're one of the first people I've spoken with that has done work in Belarus and done work with Belarus. Um, you know, this past uh, summer, uh, there was an election and uh, there was opposition people that, uh, you know, claimed they won and there were protests and then uh, and then uh, the Russian army came in. Um, is there any hope that uh, Belarus will turn around toward the West or no, it's a complete Russian uh, state now? No, there is no hope. Uh Unfortunately, so what was happening during this time after the fraud elections in 2020, uh, which Lukashenko actually lost, but then he stayed in power. Putin was supporting him uh, and he was given that support in, in return that uh, Lukashenko was giving him the sovereignty of Belarus step by step. And to this moment, so for these two years, the situation is now that Putin and Russia have full control over Belarus. That means military control, uh, economical control, and informational control. Uh, I mean, the information sphere of Belarus is the same as in Russia, the same type of propaganda and disinformation. And that means that now Putin is pushing Lukashenko to participate in this war, not only by giving the ground uh, the, uh, from which Russian troops are uh, uh, entering Ukraine and are attacking and using in the shooting rockets from the territory of Belarus, but also for Belarusian soldiers to come into Ukrainian territory and fight here also against Ukrainian troops. And uh, he is pushing very hard on that. And there are signs that Lukashenko might go for that because he was not... Um, he was not doing that before because it would be the, the end of him, the red line, because Belarusians, even though they are in on the territory of Belarus, they don't want to go into the war with Ukrainians. We always lived in peace. We had always very good relations with people in Belarus, and they do not want to go here and kill 
you know, people speaking the same language with them just because someone tells them to do so. So Lukashenko, in this case, he will have also major internal protests because people will go out and uh, protest. And that is why he is not doing that right at the moment. But I think that there is a very high possibility that Putin will make him to make this final step. And that will make that will mean the end for him like a political figure. The boundary between Poland and Ukraine has moved back and forth numerous times over the, the centuries. And there's been uh, uh, wars between Poland and Ukraine in the past. Um, but yet, uh, as you mentioned, uh, Poland has accepted, you know, two and a half, three million Ukrainian uh, refugees. Tell me about the relationship right now between Poland and Ukraine. Yeah, the Poland is helping so much Ukraine here, and there are several reasons for that. One reason is that logistics, because we have, uh, you know, very good transportation uh, logistics uh, possibilities to go to Poland. That will be the first country which where Ukrainians might go. Then there is a, a large diaspora, uh, Ukrainian diaspora, already in Poland. Mostly that there are people who were working there in agriculture sector or uh, service sector before the war. And uh, they they have some relatives here in Ukraine, and now they 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 invite them to come. So this part, and also uh, two uh, other two our countries have this history of uh, resistant totalitarian state, which Russia has become, and it happened before, before during the Soviet times, and now again we are very close together because Poles understand very good what is it to be under the constant uh, the constant threat and aggression from the neighbor and that is why they they give this possibility for ukrainians there i have so many friends in poland who offer any kind of help who provide so many humanitarian aid they help people on the border take them on their own cars from the border to their homes open the doors of their homes and give possibility also for children. So uh, enormous help and uh, that is very important for Ukrainians now to feel this unity with Poland. I had one person tell me that that Putin and, and the Russian uh, establishment wasn't really worried about uh, Ukrainian territory. What they were worried about was the example of democratic uh, capitalistic uh, uh, progress and, uh, and that uh, the example first of Poland that had done very well since its uh, separation from uh, the Soviet Union and, and the communist bloc. Uh, and then second of all, uh, progress within uh, uh, the Baltics. And then third of all, uh, you know, the resurgence of Ukraine uh, after 1989 um, was a threat to, to Russia, not from any territorial means, but by the example of prosperity. Uh, do you think that the Russians, do you think that Ukrainians are aware of progress within the Baltics and Poland? And is Russia aware of progress within Ukraine? What I know for sure is that Russia does not understand what is current Ukraine. Because after 2014, when there was this, uh, the Maidan and the Ukrainians uh, were dying for to be part of the European Union uh, in, in this fight against the Yanukovych uh, regime. So since that, uh, Ukraine has gone a very long way of of state of, of national national building and Ukraine now and before are two different countries and Russia and Russian people do not realize that and I see even even it in even the expert community because they still live in this paradigm that it is all the same and that the probably you are like you are like Russians but a little bit more different so they do not understand the the, the self confidence and self-understanding of Ukrainians as, as part of the European Union, as part of the European community. And uh, this, this understanding will come, but now they do not grasp that. And uh, also the, that was uh, one of the reasons the, the uh, Ukrainian revolution in 2014, which Putin cannot overcome. He is, he is returning always to that point in his speeches when uh, he, he, the Russian media still call it a Nazi coup that happened in Ukraine. They say that this is the non-legitimate power right now in uh, Kiev. They call it always a regime. 
and uh, it means that they deny to accept what was what happened but you know it's it's like in real life and everywhere you might you might close your eyes deny something happening but you cannot change that only because you're you you not accept something it has already happened and putin cannot he has nothing to do with that he cannot change that the more uh, the more aggressive uh, russian war becomes the more anti russian politics uh, so anti russian sentiment they see uh, in ukraine and uh, now poland and baltic states and other european countries are supporting ukraine as never before we were we were before will never seen that germany will supply defensive weapons to ukraine it was something unthinkable and and other countries and i you know after that i started posting videos i received messages throughout the world and from countries which were previously you know uh, very um, so to speak in good relations with russia and now they all all people from that countries write me and tell me that this is an aggressive offensive war that should not be happening and all the countries are united in this you know um uh, in this uh, in, in this uh, relations to to putin which be, which is becoming a paria and and becoming a, a state which will be isolated from the from the free world from the normal world and from the world community we're chatting tonight with maria adiva who uh, is in kharkiv ukraine we're going to take a final break for some messages and come back with some concluding comments in just a minute fascinating conversation stay with us everybody We're back in the Brian Crumby Radio Hour on Saga 960. We're chatting with Maria Avdiva, who is uh, in Kharkiv, Ukraine. Uh, Kharkiv is 40 kilometers from the Russian border in northeastern Ukraine. It's been under attack for uh, um, over three weeks. Uh, and uh, and uh, Maria, you know, you're unique. You, you're, you've got a, a law degree. You've got a PhD. You speak four languages. You have been working in a university. You've been an expert on uh, on uh, cybersecurity issues and, and disinformation issues. Um, you've been speaking around uh, the world. Um, and now you're fighting a war. And you go out every day and you uh, videotape atrocities. How are you surviving? Well, it's because I have this feeling that I need to do as much as possible for Ukraine to win this war. I do not have any other option. Every day I do not think about what was in my what was previously because I uh, you know I can I cannot even watch the the, the videos from my previous life because uh, not to 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 feel not to be weak. I need to be strong now and need to fight and the, my way of fighting is providing information, giving comments, speaking to people and given them possibility to see what is it when the war came to your country in 2022 in in this era well when we were all thinking that the uh, the times of world war ii are already back very far in history but now it comes here so i try to live every day to, to the maximum, not thinking about the hardships or anything, just do what I need to do. Because I speak, I have some friends among military, among territorial defense units, we are in constant contact. I understand that for them, situation is much more difficult. They are on the forefront, they don't have any minutes, any spare minute to rest. They are there in extreme cold conditions. You know, if, uh, they are risking their life uh, every minute, and that is the least I can do in 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 my part. So, in in my part of expertise, and what can can I do to help Ukraine? And many other people are risking their lives, like volunteers or who provide humanitarian aid, who go from house to house to bring food to people who cannot come out. So, Ukrainians are now a great nation, which I am very proud of. Kharkiv is only 40 kilometers from the Russian border. How did Ru the Russian, the powerful Russian army not go 40 kilometers in 25 days? What, what happened? What did the people of Ukraine and, and Kharkiv do to stop the mighty Russian army? Yeah, uh, it looks like, you know, all this mighty Russian army was a myth 
created by Putin and his cronies because uh, Russian troops managed to, to, de to do this 20 kilometers in the first day. So actually in the first day they managed to, uh, to get close to the border with the city. And it was uh, really interesting that uh, the, the, the editor, the chief editor of Russian RT, Russia Today, the, the main you know, international Russian state TV channel, she posted the, the fake photo with Russian flag on the building of uh, regional you know, Kharkiv State Administration on the first day of the war, saying that we've got Kharkiv, Kharkiv is ours. And uh, uh, she then deleted that post because uh, Russians never ever were able to get into the city on all their attempts were, uh, were very effectively fought back. And now they are stalled in the positions they have made and the Ukrainian troops even counter attack them. And uh, there are, I have seen myself the Russian military vehicles on the streets of Kharkiv destroyed because they tried to enter. They made several attempts to enter the city. When they saw that it is not working that way, they now even do not attempt to enter the city. They just shell and uh, uh, use uh, uh, rockets to uh, to hit the the Kharkiv from from uh, from the territory of Russia. And uh, that is not working like that for Putin uh, because uh, it means that uh, all the, that was uh, Russia was creating about itself, how powerful and mighty Russia is. It was not all the, the case. It, is, it was all the myth that Putin created. And now when all the world sees that, so that they, they are the huge country, uh, this, the first largest in the world can, can do nothing with uh, 45 million Ukraine and the uh, Ukrainians are fighting and resisting fiercely and uh, uh, Putin cannot do anything with that. So that gives uh, you no know, all the world a picture what actually if you have a willingness and persistence and resistance and this feeling that you need to fight then you can fight with anyone and you will win. Do you have a message for Canadians in Toronto that uh, are listening to you tonight? Yes, thank you all of you who are supporting Ukraine. I know that there are so many of you. I, I receive messages from Canada, like hundreds of messages with the words of support to Ukrainians. And I know that Canada was always supporting and continues to support Ukraine. And that is very important for us to know and uh, to feel that and to feel that unity with you. And uh, I want you to push not to, you know, to to understand that the war is not over, it is going on, and you should continue supporting Ukraine and pushing your government to give more and more support to Ukraine. Because uh, Russia will also invest uh, resources and money to create the, and to, you know, to, to make this lobbying efforts all over the Western countries. And then sometime they will start talking that uh, there is no war going on and uh, it's some kind of crisis and we do not have to concentrate on that. No, we need to stand here till the end, until the war is over and it is now going on and we need to have all support to the maximum which can be provided by Canada and by you to Ukraine. And thank you for all you have already done for my country. Maria Ardiva. Uh, from Kharkiv, Ukraine, uh, research director at the European Expert Association, and uh, and it would appear a part-time, uh, uh, if not full-time, um, photojournalist uh, documenting what's going on uh, with the atrocities in Kharkiv right now, and and commenting uh, to different media and other people around the world. Thank you so much for what you're doing. Uh, please keep safe, and uh, if you can connect in with us again and let us know how you are, uh, we'd appreciate it. Um, if I can just say. A final word, and that is, uh, I do think this is a war between Russia and democracy and freedom and uh, and and the future. And I think we have to support um, the Ukrainian people and people like Maria and uh, and the country Ukraine. Thank you very much, everyone. That's our show for tonight. I'm on every Monday through Friday at six o'clock on 9:60 a.m. You can stream me online every night 
at six o'clock on Triple W uh, Saga, 960 AM from Kharkiv uh, as well. Uh, and all my podcasts and video casts are available on briancrombie.com, on Facebook, Instagram, uh, LinkedIn, and YouTube, and uh, on Apple, Audible, and SpeakEasy and SoundCloud podcasts. Thanks for joining us, everybody. Good night. Thank you, Brian. It was great.